Royal shakeup. Saudi Arabia's king issues a decree that his 31-year-old son will now be next in line to the throne, sidelining his nephew. And Theresa May tells Brussels she won't kick EU citizens out of the UK after Brexit. We'll examine the fallout from the biggest stories of the past seven days. This is Insight Review. Welcome to Insight Review, our look back at the stories that have dominated the headlines for the past seven days. It has been a week where a 31-year-old prince was designated next in line to the throne of one of the Middle East's most powerful nations, a week where a terrorist plowed a van into worshippers at a London mosque. We'll examine those with our guests, broadcaster and journalist Georgina Godwin and senior analyst at the International Interest, David Emeka Ogbugu. But first, here's a look at what you need to know about what happened this week, seven days in 60 seconds. Firefighters in Portugal finally succeeded in extinguishing the worst forest fires in the country's history. The effort to control the fires in the country's central region took more than 1,200 firefighters and nine water-dropping aircraft. Authorities say the forest fires claimed more than 60 lives. The French president has completed a cabinet reshuffle after a landslide win in the country's parliamentary elections. Emmanuel Macron's new team includes an even split of men and women, many of whom come from outside the French political scene. Soldiers in Belgium killed a would-be suicide bomber at Brussels Central Station in what appeared to be a failed terrorist attack. The man, who was gunned down after setting off a small explosion, was wearing a rucksack and a bomb belt. Nobody was injured in the incident. And South Africa's highest court has ruled that a vote of no confidence against President Jacob Zuma can be held in secret. We begin this week with a surprise change to the succession plan of one of the most powerful nations in the Middle East. Saudi Arabia's King Salman announced it is now his son and no longer his nephew who is next in line to the throne. Let's just remind you of recent history of the Saudi royal family. Saudi Arabia was ruled until 2015 by King Abdullah. He died at the age of 90, having been on the throne for a decade. Following Abdullah's death, his then 79-year-old half-brother, King Salman, ascended to the throne. Next in line to the throne after King Abdullah was the now former Crown Prince Mohammed bin Nayef, who also served in the key positions of Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Interior. This week, King Salman relieved Mohammed bin Nayef of all positions by royal decree. Salman has now designated that his 31-year-old son, Mohammed bin Salman, the kingdom's new Crown Prince. And it seems there were no hard feelings with the former Crown Prince Mohammed bin Nayef immediately pledging his allegiance to his younger cousin. I'm joined now by broadcaster and journalist Georgina Godwin and senior analyst at the International Interest, David Imeka Ogbugu. First of all, let me ask you about Saudi Arabia in terms of who cares? I mean, what does this say about Saudi Arabia? You want to take it, Georgina? Oh, I think it's incredibly important. As you say, it's one of the most powerful countries in the region, probably the most powerful country in the region. Uh, and I think we should all care. We should all pay attention because what this is an example of is further Trumpification. This, uh, Donald Trump arrived in Riyadh. He had a meeting there. Uh, this was the trigger for, for this. We've now seen a huge amount of deals go through. I think it's a $110 billion, the defense deal that, that, that the the new crown prince has now signed uh, and uh, there's a surge of new agreements between America and Saudi Arabia so I think it's very important from from that side I also think that uh, although there are a lot of negatives there are some positives he is talking about more rights for women women will be able to take very sure. senior jobs Young, like progressive he's exactly. reformed the economy so when Saudi Arabia is trying to get away from its its uh, oil based revenue uh, sorry, I didn't, and I didn't mean to interrupt there. You were just wrapping up that. No, I, I think that, that there are women who will be able to take uh, very senior positions, like, for instance, I think the, the head of the stock exchange. He's clamping down on uh, religious extremism, we understand. However, he's very inexperienced. He's very hawkish. Uh, the situation with Yemen, with Qatar, all very serious, and he is driving those conflicts. David? Um, I don't think there will be a significant difference. I think the jingoistic and aggressive tone towards Iran will continue as it has done for many years. Uh, as you've just mentioned now, in terms of the war in Yemen, which for many human rights activists, this is a serious issue. But this was an issue that was taking place before 
uh, he was actually named to be the new next king. Although, I mean, your point on Iran is really important, right? Because yeah. he says that, that in, in a speech, on te in a television interview, rather, last month, that it, it is impossible to have dialogue with Iran because it is seeking to control the Islamic world. We are a primary target for the Iranian regime, he has said. And he, more importantly, then he ups the ante, saying, we won't wait for the battle to be in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Instead, we'll work so that the battle is for them in Iran. What does that mean? I think, you think I think well in terms of the soft power uh, ambitions of Saudi Arabia and Iran this stretches all the way to Nigeria in terms of the funding for mosques and other movements that they're trying to do so in terms of a global scale this is a battle that will sprawl everywhere in terms of Iran and Saudi Arabia I think that is a underlying threat to say to Iran if you continue to pursue your uh, policies in the Middle East, with regards to Hezbollah, with regards to Yemen, with regards to Syria, that Saudi Arabia, in time, if now that it seems like they've been given a pass by Donald Let's Trump. Let's move from the, the Gulf and the Middle East to the United Kingdom. This week, London's Met Police announced a criminal investigation had been launched into the cause of the Grenfell Tower block fire, which claimed the lives of 79 people. Of particular interest is this protective cladding installed on the outside of the apartment complex with deep questions now being raised if the cladding was fire retardant and if it was or wasn't banned in the United Kingdom. Firefighters expressed their disbelief as fire engines approached the towering inferno, not just at the sheer scale of the blaze, but crucially at how the fire had been able to spread upwards when the cladding was supposed to have been fire resistant. Georgina Godwin and David Emeka Ogbugu here with their take on this. The, the Met police have now come out and said they're talking about criminal charges that include manslaughter. But on who? I mean, who ultimately is responsible? Is it the people who made the cladding who say that they absolutely complied with all the laws that do exist? The laws seem a little bit woolly in this direction. Is it the council, the Kensington and Chelsea Borough Council, who uh, went to the residents, said, what kind of cladding do you want? The residents said, oh, the flame retardant one, please. They got a different, cheaper one, which wasn't, it would seem. Now, of course, heads have rolled right, this, there. And, and Georgie, let me stop you there. And, and David, this is a very important point, that the residents had a pr a cladding that was supposed to be fire resistant and in the end they were not notified according to all reports now that they were that the new cladding would go ahead but it wasn't fire resistant um, I think that is a flashing bang smokescreen to dif diffuse or dissolve blame away from those that are responsible I don't I think if they were told I'm not sure to, the, what, to what full extent did the people actually know what they were actually signing and agreeing to I think this is a ploy just to dissolve blame away from the people that should be responsible because this is a crime it's a crime against not only the people in the community but potentially other people that are going to have similar it says, I, I mean it says a lot about the how rapid this process is in the United Kingdom because in the US you'd have a district attorney appointed and you'd probably have criminal charges very quickly or a, a grand jury sitting and I think members of the public want to see that let's take a look at this quote that that, that came out 20 years ago about this clotting. In 1999, 19 years ago exactly, Fire Brigade's union, Glyn Evans, issued this chilling warning to MPs. The problem with clotting is that it will, if it is able, spread fire. It will spread it vertically. If you get multi-story buildings, you will get the fire spread up. The outside of the clotting will permit that spread of fire. Why on earth was this stuff allowed to be installed? But this is testament to how nonchalant that the people, the council was to this. They see poor people and they just say, oh, well, we're going to cut back and we're going to continue with our plans to give them what are cheap knockoffs. And this is what has deeply hurt you're, you're really so siding with Jeremy Corbyn now, the opposition leader, who says this is a class issue. Do you agree with that? I think it's very much a, a, a story about people who are sidelined within the society here. And I think what it does is prompt us to have another look at how uh, ethnic minorities and in recent immigrants and people who are on much lower incomes live and are housed. Clearly, we need to look at social housing very, very deeply here. Yeah, there, are six, there are 600 buildings being looked at now in the UK that have this cladding and now they've also found it uh, in in three hotels mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and all not of those... necessarily this cladding but similar cladding and they're trying to find out whether it's 
now fire many of those or not. people who are, are in those buildings are being moved out, albeit some of them temporarily until the cladding can be removed. Uh, and people are being rehoused. Uh, but we're in such a housing crisis in this country anyway. So what do we do? What it do we do with these buildings? Exactly. Do we let people live in them? Do we shut them down? What should the government do? Oh, they have, there's already uh, immediate inquiries. So uh, <coughs> Georgia Gould, for the, she's a uh, Labour, sorry, the council leader in Camden. She's already stated that she is going to have urgent legal advice on this in terms of her borough with some of the buildings that have similar cladding. So that is a start, uh, removing their cladding, which uh, we've heard some reports that this is already happening in this country. That is the initial start. But what the people at the grassroots want to know and hear is how long it's going to take. We've seen the recent inquiry uh, with the Iraq war and Tony Blair, and that took a very long time. And Tony Blair is left to walk free. People in this country that I've spoken to at the grassroots don't want to see another repeat of an elite that gets to walk away from a crime right. that they perceive. I mean, I think the point is also, it's just not one government. These are successive governments yes, that had indeed. warnings of, of fire hazards. You know, it's been one year since the UK's stunning referendum results added up to Brexit, which is a divorce from the European Union. But like a failed marriage, there is no easy settlement in sight. On the contrary, this week, Theresa May was in Brussels discussing Brexit. She's promising that EU nationals living in the UK will not be split up from their families once the UK leaves the Union. But is that a promise she'll be able to keep? Georgina Godwin and David Emeka Ogbugu are here. There was no starting point mentioned in this five-year window. So nobody knows if you came here in 2014 to the United Kingdom, will you be able to stay or not? And so a lot of her assurances are not very reassuring to people. And they're not very clear either. I mean, there are many, many things that were left unsaid. Now, I understand completely that the dinner she was at, at which she was making these announcements, was not a negotiating chamber. She was just giving broad brush outlines. But nevertheless, we don't know so much of the detail. One of the key things, I think, is about the European Court of Justice, whether you know, European citizens who will now be given rights in Britain uh, still fall under those laws. Because one of the main reasons people voted to leave the EU uh, was they felt that uh, British laws should always be above European laws and this reverses that and I think that's going to be a tremendous sticking point when they come to to negotiate the fine detail of it's this. A and, and a sticking point they don't necessarily have a really good position on right now because, you know, people like J.P. Morgan have come out with analysis and say the U.K. is simply ill-prepared to enter these negotiations right now, David. Uh, to be honest, it just seems like uh, lots of assertions that have been thrown into a washing machine and they've taken them out and they're just now wet and dripping and no one really wants to touch them. This, right, I think, the is... the train is hurtling down the track. I mean, yeah. Article 50 has been put in place. There's a two-year window, and those negotiations are, are starting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's an issue that we're going to have to now endure, simply because the, uh, lots of the European nations are adamant that the European Court of Justice, uh, how its uh, human rights are treated, and just in terms of rights in general, should be a sticking point for Theresa May. Theresa May has this made that red line, and this is a cause of friction for her. Now, on the point that you made, a lot of people were convinced to leave the EU based on this, you know, it's our Independence Day, we're taking everything back, this is our ontological identity, when actually, if she does crumble on this, this is going to be another U-turn she's going to have to make to allow European Court of Justice to uh, interfere. I'm curious, Georgina, do you think that, you know, there's a time frame that has been set out under Article 50. A lot of people think Brexit is never going to happen. And, and, or if it does, it, it will never fit into that two-year window. Do you think that under the rules that they can extend the negotiating period or if the EU was even willing to do so? Well, I think it's, it's quite funny that senior officials in the EU have been quoting John Lennon and saying, uh, um, uh, you know, imagine all the people living life as one and, and that actually uh, Brexit might not happen. Also, interestingly, apparently the Times tells us that senior members of the Tory party have been going to see the, the uh, European C Commission president saying, can't you just sway her a little bit? Can't you turn her away from this very hard Brexit? Is there any way that you can change Theresa's mind? I don't think so, anybody's quite sure what the hard Brexit is anymore or the soft Brexit. Well, and, and surely a soft Brexit is no Brexit at all. I mean, you're either leaving or you're not. Make up your mind, Theresa. Uh, again, it's very blurred lines in terms of, as you mentioned, soft Brexit or hard Brexit. I think for businesses in this country, they are hoping that it will be a softer Brexit and that will not deter uh, big financial institutions to leave, as some of them are already these, doing. These, these, these poor businesses really 
stuck in limbo, wondering how this is all going to play out. This is Insight Review. Coming up, the shocking dash cam footage reveals the moment a U.S. police officer shot and killed a motorist he'd pulled over for a broken taillight.